So if you don't consider yourself queer, just bear with me for a sec. If you are, you probably have those movies or books or characters that you connected with and cherished dearly as a kid. And once you grew up and figured yourself out, you might have thought back about that thing you liked and started noticing certain aspects about it, especially related to your own journey of self-discovery for wherever you fall on your gender or sexual spectrum. Like, oh, okay, now I know why I like this so much. And chances are, it probably wasn't an explicitly queer movie or character, because there just wasn't as much of that stuff, especially not that you'd see as a kid. But if you're not queer yourself, you might wonder, how come these crazy queers always pretend like not queer stuff is actually queer? Well, there are a few answers to that, and one way to understand it is actually through a movie that isn't typically known as a queer movie about a magic time traveling mannequin. Mannequin is a 1987 romantic comedy starring Kim Cattrall and Andrew McCarthy about an artist named Jonathan and the store mannequin he builds magically coming to life, but only when no one but him is around. It's essentially a modernized take on the classic Greek Pygmalion myth and a sorta of kinda of riff on the 1948 film One Touch of Venus, with the new twist being that the artist didn't technically bring a mannequin to life because she is actually an ancient Egyptian woman named Emma Hasir who had her wish granted by the gods to find true love which resulted in her being whisked through time and basically dating a bunch of historical figures until she landed in a mannequin in the 80s and came to life. It's a silly movie, just go with it. Wrapped into this is a very 80s pro-capitalist feud between an evil modern corporate mall run by skeevy scheming industrialists who are only in it for the money, and a nice family-owned mall run by weirdos who are also probably only in it for the money, but hey, they wanted to stay family owned, so they're the good kind of capitalists. It was pretty much savaged by critics at the time, saying that it's a film about, by, and for dummies, and that it's lifeless and dead, and they don't know in which dummies the gold is buried, and the current Rotten Tomatoes consensus calls it a real dummy. Yeah, got him, guys. That said, it was definitely a hit. It made a strong profit at the box office, even enough to greenlight a kind of unrelated sequel with a mostly totally new cast and production team, but it also got an Academy Award nomination for its new song. The legacy of it, though, is a little mixed. They say if you watch that video, you die. Ah, that's a lot of baloney. Though it certainly got a cult following, whether it's an underrated classic or so bad it's good, depends on who you ask. A major sticking point is its cartoonish and even childish comedy, which is certainly over the top and probably not for everybody. with some reviewers noting that it seemed to be attempting to capture the fast-paced screwball comedy vibe of old Hollywood, such as His Girl Friday, but many of them argue that it probably failed to capture that magic. Even 30 years later, a retrospective in Philly Mag gave a defense of the film, but still from the perspective that it's only watchable because it's so bad, referencing its laughably paper-thin plot and incredible leaps in logic, and criticizing how its time travel is never explained, or how the mechanics of the mannequin coming to life is inconsistent, Consistent as if anyone watching this movie like cares about the logic of an ancient Egyptian magic spell. While there certainly are some dated elements that don't hold up nowadays, like yeah, not great that Kim Cattrall is playing an Egyptian. A lot of the humor is honestly really funny. Oh my camera. The thing is that you kind of have to buy into the movie's flamboyant bigness and fantasy and over-the-top comedy, and what so many naysayers seem to miss is that it's intentionally going for a very particular style of cartoonishness, and rather than being viewed as a typical rom-com, it fits more into the rise of popular camp gay films in the 80s. What's always been perplexing to me about this movie is that it actually fits the mold to be embraced in queer circles as a queer cult movie, but tends to be pretty overlooked in those circles. And it's not just because it has a gay character or stars icons beloved by queer people like Kim Cattrall and Estelle Getty in her absolute prime, but in that it has heavy queer themes with a surprisingly positive perspective of queerness, even in the abstract. 
That's not to say it's surprising that people don't identify this as like a gay movie. I mean, it's not one. The primary plot is centered on a very straight heteronormative romance. But while this is a romance made up of a cis heterosexual relationship, the presentation of it in the context of the movie is very heavily coded as a queer one, as is the whole world of the movie really. So first, let's have a little dive into what queer theory as it pertains to film is. So in the history of art, things have been catered to and curated by predominantly white cis straight guys for a long time. And even as we see more and more diverse perspectives in art as time has progressed, the ratio within the full scope of history is still plenty unbalanced. So the easy answer for why queer people see ostensibly not queer things as queer is that sometimes we gotta reach a bit to see ourselves in media. There's also the fact that plenty of art itself has been created or influenced by queer people and culture, even if it isn't presented that way. And those elements and perspectives will be referred to or recycled by other artists who, even if they're not queer or interested in the queer experience, will still create works that harken back to those queer-inspired elements and perspectives, whether they realize it or not. And beyond that, any analysis of any media can be done through different lenses. When you refer to theory as in film theory, it's an academic look at a film's relation to reality or society through different perspectives. Things like feminist theory or Marxist theory or psychological analytic theory, and one of the more recent additions to those conversations is queer theory. In a 1996 essay, Frederick L. Green said of queer theory in film that queer theory argues that there is beauty, power, and truth, even magic, where dominant culture and its authorized language posit only ugliness, impotence, and falsehood. A lot of queer culture is based in the idea of embracing things that are considered deviant by mainstream society and authority figures, because society deemed us as deviants. It's why there are so many crossovers between queer culture and fringe subcultures like Wicca and furries and an openness for kinks. Even stuff made by people who don't want to put anything gay in what they create or are even aggressively homophobic can still have their stuff recontextualized and adopted by the gays simply because the queer audience responds to and empathizes with the characters, stories, and themes presented. So with that said, a queer reading of media can simply be defined as a reframing and recontextualizing of anything into a queer perspective by relating those things to queer history or the queer experience, regardless of creator intention. As just one of many examples, that's why you have a movie like Hocus Pocus be heavily embraced by queer people who grew up in the 90s. It has flamboyant witches and elaborate makeup and costumes inspired by drag aesthetic. It has queer ally Bette Midler performing a musical number. I had put a spell on you. It has a misfit bullied outcast who doesn't fit in. It has authority figures being useless and wrong, and its other monsters turn out to be friendly and lovable. There's not an explicitly queer character in the movie, but there are certainly aesthetics, character types, and concepts that would be easy for queer kids to latch onto. Once your eyes are open to these kinds of readings, you kind of start to see them everywhere coming out narratives, rejecting the system, hiding your identity, found family, underdogs and misfits. A lot of these themes are prevalent in a lot of stories, and it's why it seems like we queers don't ever shut up about it. So that's how we circle back to a movie like Mannequin, which doesn't necessarily center on explicitly queer people, but does carry those themes and aesthetics that, intentional or not, are worth acknowledging. And the most obvious aesthetic is the high camp style of the performances and humor. It's camp! The tragically ludicrous? The ludicrously tragic? Oh yeah, like when a clown died. Camp as a concept and style has certainly been around for a long time in different forms. A hand and it's been connected to queer culture since at least the 1900s. As the Oxford English Dictionary defined it in 1909, camp is defined as ostentatious, exaggerated, affected, and theatrical, effeminate or homosexual, or pertaining to and characteristic of homosexuals. The term and its definition has evolved over time, and there's actually plenty of scholarly writing and conversation that dissects it way better than I ever could. How would you describe camp, and how is it so intertwined in society today? Well, the kids call it extra. Ultimately, it's about challenging what the current authority views as high art and even normality and doing so by indulging in excess. Things like over-the-top emotions and bombastic gags and gaudy costumes. By the 1980s, you could see primary influences both in and from things like gay ball culture or the works of gay filmmaker John Waters.
Avengers. You could even point to films like The Wiz or Joel Schumacher's Batman movies, which are made for mainstream, not necessarily queer audiences, but still maintain the over-the-top, bombastic, and transgressive aesthetic and style of camp that you would see in a lot of queer movies. You don't need queer content or themes to be camp, and you can enjoy camp without being queer, but it's hard to be camp without attracting a queer audience or being influenced by queer themes. On filming Mannequin, G.W. Bailey, who played the bigoted security guard Felix, said, It was beyond silliness. We would do outrageous double takes over the lines and say that we hadn't done this kind of stuff since high school. And the director would say, More, more, you're going in the right direction with it. Going in the right direction? We didn't believe this. While some of the cast maybe didn't realize what was going on, the film's writer and director Michael Gottlieb certainly did, pushing the performances to be as intentionally big and bombastic as possible. Good morning, what a gentleman! <laughs> The situations are slapstick, the reactions cartoonish, and the plot points patently ridiculous, big, and flamboyant. There is literally a two and a half minute full music video complete with 14 individual costume changes in the middle of the movie. an indulgent, campy-ass movie, but intentionally so. Gottlieb doesn't have a ton of major film credits to his name. Mannequin is probably his most notable work. There isn't anything public about his stance on or association with the queer community, so there's no way to support how much of the subtext in this film was intentional. But honestly, speculating isn't even really necessary, because this particular film's stance on its explicitly gay character, Hollywood, is very clear. It's positive and sympathetic. Hollywood, as portrayed by Meshach Taylor, was a popular character with audiences, but he was a major point of criticism for the predominantly straight critics at the time. Most of the criticisms surprisingly weren't that outwardly homophobic, but more a feeling that Hollywood is an unflattering portrayal of an ultra-camp gay. For example, Roger Ebert called him an anthology of stereotypes, and another reviewer called him a gruesome caricature. There's certainly some truth there. He does contain a lot of stereotypes, and he is kind of a caricature. Maybe I should should have my hips lifted. <laughs> Hollywood. Ah! Ah! Come on. Ah! Though in all fairness, everyone is some level of cartoonish caricature given that this is a campy movie. <laughs> But even still, the criticism of Hollywood being too flamboyant makes sense for the time period. For some context, the 80s was the height of the AIDS crisis, which the government notoriously failed at helping solve and is a much more dour and complex subject to talk about than this video allows. But you could argue that it contributed to an increase of the very special episode type of portrayal of gay people in the late 80s and early 90s, sympathetic portrayals in TV and film that are essentially pleased to see queer people as, you know, actual people, telling you that there's no reason to be afraid, they're just regular normal people like you and me. Hollywood, then, is in direct contrast to the narrative that the gays can be quote-unquote regular people, because he tries very, very hard to stand out. Oh, please don't tell anyone you saw me dressed like this. I have a reputation to uphold. Plus, it's not wrong to call him a stereotype, and the sort of flamboyant gay male stereotype he is was pretty much the only stereotype ever portrayed in media at the time. It makes sense if he initially rubs you the wrong way, especially if you're in 1987. But what's funny now is that the in-your-face flamboyance of a character in a mainstream, high-grossing movie that isn't just aimed at queer people is kind of what a lot of people are asking for right now. There's that current trend for big studios to get attention by announcing the inclusion of queer characters in their mainstream, high-grossing films to be like, oh yeah, we're woke AF but then consistently have the queerness only vaguely hinted at, or shoved in the background, or applied to an inconsequential nameless character. My job, his job, and he, he cried as they were serving the salad. <laughs> There's a yearning for representation in modern times that isn't just about acknowledging the existence of queer people or even breaking stereotypes, but simply letting different types of people be who they are, regardless of how it clashes with cultural norms. That we should have already gotten past the idea that queer people exist, and instead we should let them be as vibrant and authentic as they want to be and truly are, and exist in intersectional ways. So it's actually refreshing to go back and see a movie with an openly, explicitly stated to be gay character 
character of color being as gay as possible, and the main characters not only accepting it, but actively engaging with it. In fact, the only time Hollywood's queerness is negatively commented on is by one of the overt villains, and he's immediately shut down by the protagonist for it. Oh, the little Mary has an assistant now, huh? Where do you people come from? Ohio. Ohio? You mean they got him in Ohio? So, you like your new assignment? Could have been worse. Could have put me on with a bigoted jerk. Hollywood also has an interior life and isn't just a prop for the main character. We constantly hear him talking about the ups and downs of his committed relationship and the life he's leading outside of his time at the mall. We don't see his home life on screen, sure, but we also don't see that for any characters outside of Jonathan and briefly his ex-girlfriend. The movie likes Hollywood, and so does every non-villainous character. He's certainly silly, but there is no disdain here from the perspective of the movie itself, or even the world of the movie. Movie, regardless of how over-the-top Hollywood is being portrayed. There are certainly audience members who probably laugh at his antics for the wrong reasons, which is a bummer, but that doesn't negate the fact that he was probably the most beloved part of the movie. This is Meshach Taylor's breakout role, in addition to his role in designing women, and he's even the only character and cast member that returns for the sequel. Through the way Hollywood is presented, we get a clear stance on how we're supposed to feel about him. Even if you're laughing at his antics, you're always supposed to like him and view him as heroic. And if we put that lens of positivity towards queerness over the entire movie, well... You didn't happen to run into Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Yeah. Michelangelo. Oh, yes! <laughs> oh, he wasn't very interested in me. He was involved with some guy named David. He was very old, and he died the way he wanted to in women's lingerie. Panties, right. I'm into it. See anything you like, Richard? I was just looking for panties. Hell, half the guys in this store probably wear lace underwear. Be happy to strip search you. <laughs> you know I would never bother you when you're getting a piece of wood. Media is full of queer coding which is essentially using stereotyping as shorthand. For example, tons of classic Disney villains are portrayed flamboyantly with typical queer stereotypes. You're so weird. You have no idea. While it's sometimes intentional, it often isn't. Queer people of all kinds have existed since the beginning of history, but often vilified as deviants, and thus their characteristics were associated with, you know, bad stuff. Hence many stereotypical queer attributes, and especially gay male attributes like flamboyancy, vanity, loving over-the-top musical numbers, and just generally being extra, overlap with stereotypical cartoon villain attributes. They are very overtly queer coded. On the positive end, you also have queer coding in superheroes. For one, a lot of costumes and superhero aesthetics draw from more homoerotic subtext and even fetishes than a lot of people probably realize. But more importantly, many themes and tropes of superhero stories stories correspond directly with the experience of queer people. Honey, are, are you sure you're a vampire slayer? I, I mean, have you tried not being a slayer? Have you tried not being a mutant? Superheroes usually have secret identities, secret lives where they live as their true, authentic, and often more colorful and flamboyant selves while hiding this from even their closest loved ones for fear that the truth could result in someone getting hurt, or in some cases, rejected. And it's always cathartic when the hero can finally reveal who they are to the person they love and learn that they were accepted. With something like Mannequin, the coding of certain characters is even more palpable given the queerness of the entire movie around them. Right from the second we meet the main character, he himself is pretty heavily queer-coded. I am so glad you're working here. <laughs> you are. I never thought they'd hire anyone stranger than me. I'm a regular kind of guy, okay? Don't disappoint me. Jonathan is an artist and a weirdo, a big dreamer who's just trying to be himself in a world that keeps putting annoying constraints on him. Reality is very disappointing. Who can't seem to fit in and is in an unhappy relationship with an unsatisfied girlfriend. Oh look, the road warrior. Okay, but who doesn't think motorcycles are cool? His name is literally Jonathan Switcher. How about a picture? Mom will think I switched. When he meets Emmy, it plays out like a magical eye-opening experience, where for the first time he's allowed to let loose without judgment and be loved for who he is. You know, you are the first thing I've created in a really long time that made me feel like an artist. And he finds a place where he feels comfortable being who he is. Roxy, I'm not the same guy I used to be. I finally found a place where I belong. I got friends here, people who care. 
and someone who makes me feel good about myself. But he ultimately settles on being out and proud about his relationship, no matter how weird, wrong, or deviant people think it is. Are you really sure that you want to do this? Absolutely. Who cares what people think? <gasps> Look at him with the dumping. Who are you to criticize? Emmy, for her own right, is a little harder to slot into this lens, being a magical fantasy woman, and you could argue she maybe leans uncomfortably towards manic pixie dream girl territory by today's standards. But a nice difference from that trope is that she did have a long and storied history independent of Jonathan for presumably hundreds of years before she met him, and she's perfectly fine with the idea of the two of them separating if he ever had an opportunity that would take him away. But a fascinating reading of her actually came from a negative review in the Chicago Tribune, which disparagingly calls Emmy E.T. with good legs. The reviewer was comparing the movie's romance to a boy has a magical secret friend kind of trope, like that of E.T., but in this case, just one that's a sexual secret friend. But the idea of having any kind of secret relationship that most people wouldn't approve of, especially a romantic or sexual one, is part of the classic real-life queer narrative that a lot of queer young people have experienced. Emmy opens up a new world for Jonathan that lets him be who he is with someone he loves in a way he never loved another person before, even if he's at first afraid to tell his mom and boss about it. And hell, comparing a magical fantasy character like Emmy to an alien like E.T. in in this context also brings up how fantasy, sci-fi, and horror characters are often adopted into the queer community. And you are mine. The simple idea of being fascinated by someone weird and abnormal and othered is, again, part of what it's like to be a kid who's exposed to queer culture for the first time, after years of being told that those monsters and perverts are weird and wrong. On the other side of things, you have James Spader's character, Mr. Richards, who is implicitly straight, but who exudes a lot of negative gay stereotypes. No thanks for necessary switcher. Foppish, vain, and subservient, and you could argue he's the bad kind of gay coding, a la Disney villains. Richards, where in the hell did you learn to kiss ass like that? What, did you take a class? No, sir, no. That's a God-given gift. <laughs> if we didn't have the positive out and proud Hollywood as a foil. If Richards is queer, he's never out about it, and his being closeted would fit into the pent-up, likely self-loathing members of the Illustra Mall. I don't understand it. This never happened to our mom before, never! Where can I get a mannequin to? Because a major message of this movie is that you should be out and proud. Whether that refers to being gay, or being an artist, or just being any category of weirdo, as long as you're being a good person and being yourself. The reactions to Jonathan's relationship varies across multiple characters, and exposes each of their own prejudices. The employees of Illustra are disgusted by it. Ooh, that little prevert! You were one sick. Puppy. So much so that they want to literally beat him up. Sound familiar? When the villains catch him in the act, it's all about exposing this big secret relationship that the outside world doesn't approve of, which could cost him his career and destroy his reputation. These pictures, they could, they could kind of ruin his life. <laughs> Again, sound familiar? Conversely, his co-workers at Prince and Company are generally accepting of him. In fact, the movie illustrates the entire spectrum of tolerance and allyship from that surface tolerance in a not that there's anything wrong with that kind of way where they're only being tolerant to your face. Oh, who's Thomas? Please, Jonathan, it's all yours. Thanks, men's room's broken. Of course, dear, whatever you say. He's talking to the dummy again. To the more benign, I don't care what you do because I see your value as a human being. This store has never been more successful and it's all due to Jonathan Switcher. I don't care if he puts a rubber glove on his head and runs naked through the store yelling, Hi, I'm a squid! Hi. And then to complete embrace, love, and celebration of who you are. And once the magic spell is overcome by the power of love or whatever, the family we see at the forefront of Jonathan and Emmy's wedding are the characters of Prince and Company, their found family who accepted them without hesitation or judgment. Ultimately, Mannequin does exactly what Green defined as queer theory, recognizing that there is beauty, power, truth, and magic in spaces where the dominant power posits only ugliness. The mall could be a space of judgment and pent-up anger like it is at Illustra, or it could be a space of acceptance and love. The villains think the weirdos are weird and bad, and if they can't be controlled, then they have to be eliminated, whereas everyone at Prince and Company embraces the weirdos as individuals who are beautiful and real and important. Obviously, it's more important to celebrate media that is explicit in representing queerness, rather than burying it in themes and relegating it to supporting characters. But Mannequin is a nice illustration of how those queer ideas can still be presented to mainstream audiences, even in places you might not expect them, and in ways that might have nudged some people in the direction of queer acceptance, even if subtly or subconsciously.
And really, it's just fun to see how a movie that isn't targeted at a specific community can still resonate with that community, if given the chance. And if you're like me and you were a queer kid who loved this movie but never really understood why, well, this is probably your answer.